Welcome, everybody. I'm Shane McAllister. And I'm on the developer relations team here at MongoDB. And this is MongoDB TV Cloud Connect, which streams every Thursday on what's good and exciting in the world of all things database related. And today is no different. So while we're waiting to get underway, I'd just like to welcome you all. If you're a seasoned viewer, it's great to have you back for another what looks like to be a thrilling episode. And if you're new to this party, a big warm welcome to you. Do dive in to our past shows and stay tuned for more excitement, both on YouTube and LinkedIn. While we gear up for today's episode, do drop a shout out in the chat on LinkedIn or YouTube. Tell us who you are and where you're tuning in from. We're all ears and we love to hear from our fantastic viewers and those that join us on these live streams. And once the show kicks off, Feel free to pop in any questions you have for our guests, and we'll tackle them either live or we'll wrap them up at the end as well, too. So we get this question all the time. So quick heads up, the live stream is being recorded and we'll be hitting MongoDB's YouTube and LinkedIn post show as well, too. So if life intervenes and pulls you away, fear not, you can catch up on the recording later, no problem at your leisure. And of course, either on YouTube or LinkedIn, please like and subscribe on YouTube if you haven't done so already. And follow us on LinkedIn to keep up with the latest posts, the hottest news, shows and events just like this one. So with all that housekeeping out of the way, let's get on with the show. Today is an exciting live stream demo where we're going to dive into the powerful synergy between Amazon SageMaker and MongoDB Atlas in the realm of vector search. We're going to explore key insights from a recently published series of articles on our MongoDB Developer Center, and we're going to discover how these cutting edge technologies come together to revolutionize search capabilities. So if SageMaker and MongoDB Vector Search are a dynamic duo, then we'll need a similarly dynamic duo to present on today's live stream. So, I'm really, really delighted to be joined once again by my colleague, Dominic Fry, and I also welcome my other colleague, Diego Fernice, uh, to the stream. How are you both? I'm good. That was a great intro. Good. I love it. No worries. So, Dominic, you're a regular-ish when we do the AWS-related shows here, but why don't, for the newer viewers, just introduce yourself, your background, what you do, how you got here in MongoDB, etc. How I got here, um, I got invited <laughs> by Shane to join the stream. Um, so yeah, just about me. My name is Dominic, as, as Shane already said. I joined MongoDB about three and a half years ago by now. Time flies, actually. And um, I'm, I'm mainly on the engineering side, joined DevRel about two years ago, and I'm responsible here mainly for everything MongoDB and AWS, which means demos, workshops tutorials, videos, and obviously live streams like this one. Excellent, excellent. And jumping across to Southern Spain near Seville, Diego, why don't you introduce yourself, yourself to our audience and similarly your background and your role here in MongoDB? We don't have time just for me to introduce my background because as I'm old, you know, I've been using computers since, <laughs> I, I don't know, since the Recent 80s. background then. So. As we yeah, can see recent. in the background. <laughs> yeah, as, as you can see back there. So uh, in the latest years, I've been doing mostly mobile development, uh, mostly iOS and Android. So I joined the company just to work on the Atlas device sync uh, side of things. But these days I'm doing mostly backend and mostly, well, uh, just uh, doing talks and, and you know, uh, running workshops and stuff like that. And Right now, I'm trying to learn Rust, which uh, is a different beast from everything that I've seen before. So that's what I do right now. Excellent, excellent. And look, at, as I said in the intro, please do join in in the comments. Let us know who you are, where you come from. It's great to see people joining in from all over the world. We've got Boston, India, Nigeria, Argentina, and elsewhere as well, too. So we do appreciate that. As we go through the show today and as we go through the demo that both Dominic and Diego are going to be showing, any comments that are relevant, we'll bring them onto the screen. We'll discuss them. This the beauty of Cloud Connect and the beauty of doing a live stream is we will interact with you. This isn't a webinar. It's not pre-recorded. We're going to interact with you. So we love to get your questions on board. 
So Dominic, this stream today is all about uh, Amazon SageMaker and MongoDB Vector Search. You've written a couple of articles recently on this topic, which is why I nabbed you and some of your time and Diego as well too, to jump on and explain those. So at a high level, what was the inception of this article series and what can viewers expect to learn in the next 60 minutes or so with us? Yeah, so the, the article series is about using MongoDB vector search on one side, which is something that we're going to talk about in a second in a bit more detail, and the capabilities of all those great AWS services that we got on the other side, and in that case specifically, an AWS service called SageMaker, which is Amazon's machine learning service, and combine those two together to be able to semantically search data. And that's something that we're going to look into today, how to yeah, how to set up SageMaker on one side, be able to access it, and then use it to create something that's called embeddings, um, which we need to be able to actually search our data, and then on our side vector search, which is the actual like the actual execution of the search, and that's what the article in three parts is about. It's going in in very much detail to explain to everyone, even on the beginner level, on how exactly to do that, and we're going to look into some parts of that today. Um, and show you how, how that's going to work um, in a bit more like visual manner, I'd say. Excellent. And so the article that Dominic mentions is up on MongoDB's Developer Center, which is where Dominic, Diego, and the rest of the DevRel team, and indeed our wider product and engineering team as well, to post all our technical articles, our how-tos, our getting started, and, and more in-depth as well, too. So if you want to go and see what we have there. It's super easy to get there. You just go to developer.mongodb.com and you'll see the list there. If you click in and search for AWS, for example, you'll see this you've part one and also part two, right, Dominic? Yeah, I've also put the link into the YouTube or LinkedIn channel, at least I thought so. Wait, I should probably press enter. <laughs> Look at that. Um, okay. And then you can actually find it here to, oh no, it actually worked. This is weird, LinkedIn showing a weird pop-up. Exactly, so that's a direct link to the to the article. Uh, part two is linked in there as well, but, and it's also showing up as a series. And part three will actually be published tomorrow, so definitely watch out for that. Excellent, I love it. It, it, the, it's great that it flows and follows along. And obviously, you know, those that join in us on the live stream will be able to see the guts of it being presented by the author. and. Diego's role and my role in particular is to quiz Dominic on why he did this and why he did that and how he made these things work and integrate together so tightly. So I think it's a jam-packed session. I suppose, Dominic, let's get started. And uh, the screen's already up there. So where, where are we starting? Good. Yeah. So the first thing that I just want to start with very quickly, and I'm trying to zoom in a little bit further here, is to just use this architecture picture, which helps us to get a quick idea of what we're going to look into today and what you'll actually see in the three-part series to, to uh, be able to actually develop what you need here. And the first part that we're going to look into is the, the AWS side and the question, how do I actually get those embeddings that I need? And for those of you that are a bit new to um, machine learning or AI in general, an embedding, also called a vector, is really just a representation of your data in a way that the, um, yeah, the, the machine that is behind that, to put it maybe that way, actually understands how your data look like, looks like and um, yeah, what, it, what your data is made of. And vector search is using those vectors, and that's why it's called vector search, to then actually execute searches across your data. But we need to prepare that part first. So as you can see here on the, on the right side, the most important part is what we call here a model deployment. And that is what Amazon SageMaker is going to provide for you. Amazon SageMaker being the um, overall machine learning tool that you can use to do all kinds of things from deploying a model, training a model, um, fine tuning a model, and really everything around um, machine learning and specifically with regards to those models, uh, that's, that's going to be happening on the Amazon SageMaker side. SageMaker itself provides an endpoint to us, which you can use either externally or just using other additional AWS services. And what we're going to do here to make this quite, quite easy to access and to have like a, a proper 
interface here is another service that you're probably familiar with if you've used at AWS before. AWS Lambda, which is a way of offering serverless functions, which use the Amazon SageMaker endpoint and then provide those embeddings to the outside. By outside, I first have to go to something that actually exposes this function as a REST service um, in that case, and that is with yet another service that is also available, which is called Amazon API Gateway. And this is giving us a, a generic REST service that we can use in, in applications. In the server application that I'll show you a little bit later, it's written in Python, and the repository to that is also available, and the link to that is in the um, in the article as well. So definitely go ahead and have a look at that when you read the article because the code that you need is there. And what we're going to look into part three of the tutorial tomorrow, but also today a little bit later in our live stream is how can I actually use Atlas and Atlas search to execute a vector search on my data and figure out what's actually going on with my data and being able wow. to semantically search it. But uh, Dominic, wait, I, I have like a few questions because, you know, I joined this live stream just to learn about all this stuff. Mm -hmm. and you are talking about vectors and embeddings are yeah. the same or are different? It's basically the same term for what we do here. So it's called, okay. it's called, uh, an, it's a, called an embedding. Um, you will also see if you go to SageMaker, those models are called embeddings models. Um, or it's called an embeddings model and this Basically, what it's doing is creating an embedding of that data, and then embedding is a vector in case of SageMaker or specifically the model that we're using, um, a vector with 384 entries or dimensions, which is the other term that is used. Um, yeah, that's that's what the vector represents. So, so the you, dimensions you have like a... of vectors are something that I always get questions about. I always hear yeah. people asking. You mentioned there that we're using in this example 384. You can, I think MongoDB vector search supports up to 2048. That's correct. My impression. So, a vector when you take this, and you'll you'll see hopefully in the console a little later because I saw it in the run through. You'll see a vector, an actual vector. It's simply a number representing the semantic meaning behind data, and we can use this in whatever embeddings model um, that we are using to, I suppose, make sense of our data. And Correct. the n-dimensional aspect of it is, is that we can group things in different ways. And it's very hard for us human beings who live in a four-dimensional space to figure these things out. But computers are super good <laughs> at n-dimensional stuff, right? That's exactly what it is, yeah. That's a good sign. So I, I have a couple of questions because these vectors are numbers or strings or what what are they holding They're, they are numbers let me just quickly go over here i'm not going to go too much into the details but i might as well just show you the data right away um so if i come over here and you see an entry here when i look at our at our atlas cluster and that database which is uh, the the database is our sample database but the collection is called embedded movies and one of the entries that we've seen here one of the fields is called embedding and the embedding, if you open that, first of all, the number here tells you how many entries there are in this area, 384. And then what you can see here is you just got a long list of numbers with mm -hmm. a lot of decimals, uh, decimal places. They might be positive, they might be negative. Um, they are ranging between plus one and minus one and represent the data in a way that the vector search engine can actually work with it and figure out how this, this vector is related to a query or a search um, a question, basically, that you might put into it. And the key thing here, too, is that, you know, unless you live in the matrix, you don't understand these as numbers. You're not intended to understand these as numbers. Exactly. We use the embeddings to create these vectors, and we also send our query through the same embeddings to create to create a vector for that query, which is then runs run against the data. And MongoDB vector search was announced uh, back in our .local New York last June. Um, and in essence, for us, it means that the key value that we bring to the table there is if your data is in Atlas, we store the vectors alongside your data. So, and I think you called it out in your article as well too, Dominic, is that data that is accessed together should be stored together. And that's the key thing. 
people in the vector space and in the AI space are used to vector databases. In all most instances up until recently, that vector database introduced a second database into your data. So you stored your data somewhere, you vectorized that, which was stored somewhere else. And that's a round trip for any query. So that's the key, I suppose, really, really, really powerful thing that we bring having vector search built in natively into Atlas search. Yeah, that's a super important part because what it ev eventually means is it enhances the performance and the performance is super mm -hmm. important. And being able to actually get those results super quickly is, is very important because I'm an impatient user, right? So if I use an app or a tool or a website or whatever, I don't want to wait for the results. Mm -hmm. And of course, the vector search itself is super, super quick. So for a single user, that wouldn't matter. But imagine having like loads of requests get, getting sent against the database. And they add up eventually. And if you have just too many requests um, that are taking too long, the individual user would end up waiting. And that's something you definitely don't want. And having the data together in here and then by having the embeddings in, our, in, in the same database and enabling vector search, um, all those things combined, first of all, offer the functionality, but then on the other side also mean that the functionality that we offer is very, very performant, very fast. And that's a very important thing these days. And I'm pretty sure I'm not the only person who's impatient. So talking about impatient people, I want to see all this SageMaker stuff that I don't know anything about. So if you can that's please. a good point yeah i i'd that's say we should, we should start here otherwise we're, we're not going to finish because it's already 20 past so um <laughs> i'm, I'm going to show you how all that works and i'm not actually going to click through i just realized i'll definitely just show you um what that actually means and maybe the only thing i'm going to show you here is let me just go to like an empty region here so you can get an idea so the first tool that we need sagemaker and the cool thing about sagemaker is um, like one of the cool things is the setup is super easy. That's something that I really appreciate if I just want to try something out, right? So when you get into SageMaker, there is an option to say, okay, just set up for a single user, prepare everything that I need, and let me just start. So SageMaker is then going to go ahead and create something that's called a domain, which is basically just a just imagine for now it's a container where everything is sorted into. It creates a user for you, which is one one thing that you need, and that user can then interact with whatever you want. And if we just go back to the one that I've already prepared over here, those, this is the one that I need, perfect. Those um, users can then access something that's called the studio. And the studio is really the app that you work in when accessing SageMaker, which is giving you the opportunity to look into models, deploy those models, um, run experiments. You see all kinds of op options that um, you can do, you can create jobs in here for training, you can set up whole pipelines for multiple things that you want to do. But the interesting thing that you'll see described in the article is that there's also something that's called Jumpstart. And Jumpstart, which probably already suggests by the name, is a way to very quickly get started with Amazon SageMaker and your machine learning experience. And what Jumpstart lets you do is to come over here, choose a model, and the model that you'll see that we've chosen in the article is the all mini M, all mini LM L6 V2. Um, there's many different- Always good to have here. a very rememberable name, right? Yeah, yeah. it's great, right? Um, Why did, that's... this comes up, I suppose, when we do a lot of the Gen AI shows, um, how do you choose a model? Why did you choose this model in this instance? Or was it, you know, the first one you came across or the one that you were more familiar with? How, how did this, because you can choose any model, right? So why this one? I asked Igor. <laughs> so for those who don't know, Igor is our one of our many uh, great partners on the AWS side. And he's someone who's also regularly on this show. And he's also working a lot with uh, SageMaker and the tools attached to them. And the, the first question that you have to ask yourself is what you actually want to do. So if, if you look at this one down here, this is a model for text embeddings. That's basically the only requirement we do have in that case. We need a model that is able to produce text embeddings as opposed to, for example, here, just randomly because I typed in mini, the light on mini instruct 4DB is a text to text generation. We don't want that. We don't want to generate text from text. We want to generate embeddings. 
But beyond that, you can basically choose whatever model you want. They are slightly different. You can look into the details. Some models are a bit more, um, are, are bigger, some are smaller. Um, some have like other use, specific use cases. Um, I have to say, I don't, I haven't looked into all those models because there's just so many you can choose from, which is amazing. Um, but to get started, I chose one um, that I knew was going to work out. And that's uh, literally the reason why I went ahead and thought, I'm actually going to ask my colleague Igor, the model that he's used before that he has good experiences with. Um, I guess you can also look at the download numbers. This one has, down has been downloaded quite a number of times, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. has gotten some likes. So that's probably a good idea. But in the end, I would suggest if you want to go into the details, read the descriptions of the of the models specifically. They tell you quite a lot about what's going on here. But the important part, just to go back to that, is that we need to have, where does it say that? Yeah, it actually says over here, the task text embedding. That's the important part. OK, and that is key because obviously with a lot of the Gen AI work that's going on at the moment, people are familiar with images and video and audio and everything else in between so you know this example text embeddings was perfect but if you were looking to you know generate a, an ai image based on your text input you would choose a different embedding model exactly and the model is just to because i see the number right here stated actually the model is what influences how big your vector is going to be how many dimensions your vector is going to have so the 384 we saw previously by looking into our data here that we look into again later when we actually look at the vector search is coming uh, from the model and the model is what determines the, uh, the the length of the vectors in that case it's just 384 and if you if you choose your model the good thing is the only thing you really need to do is to start deploying this and it's great it's hidden behind the feedback button here um so <laughs> the only thing you need to do is to actually choose your instance type there's loads of different instance types that you could choose from I leave this one at the default i only need one instance and i deploy it and then i get an endpoint that's ready for me um, to use when you did this the first time dominic how long does it take to generate i know we're not going to do not... it live because it would chew up most of the show but yeah it's not even going to take too long it's like five or ten minutes um okay. Depends a bit uh, on how, uh, which model you choose. Mm. That's what I'm trying to say. Uh, and which instance type you choose, probably. Even though I would, it might take a bit longer if you choose a bigger instance type. I haven't tried that, but I, I assume it's, it's very similar for most of them. But it's like it's it's very quick. It's like yeah, five, six, seven minutes. But I've prepared that already, so I don't really need to wait for that. If you clicked on deploy the way I just uh, showed you. The important part is you'll end up with an endpoint which has a very cryptic name compared comprised of jumpstart there's a hugging face text embedding all because it's the all mini something something and then you got a date here and then some kind of that's probably the time when i created it because i did the run through today so that's how that name is uh uh coming into place and the only reason I mention that is because this is the name that you use to actually access the SageMaker endpoint using Lambda, which I'm mm -hmm. going to go over mm -hmm. in a second. You could also invoke that directly with the URL here if you have access to that AWS account uh, and get the credentials for it, obviously. But that's one option to do. Um, we chose in that case to actually just use Lambda and API Gateway to expose it. So let's take this one and come over to Lambda. As I said before, Lambda, for those who don't know, is it's just a, a very simple and easy to use, yet very powerful way to offer serverless functions that you can run. Um, in, in that case, the, the good thing about this is I can just run that Lambda to access the SageMaker endpoint that's deployed in the same AWS account. So I also don't have to fight with credentials and whatnot. Mm -hmm. The only thing I really have to do is um, access the endpoint by its name. And you see the name down here. Um, that's like slightly different because the one I created earlier today was just uh, to showcase that um, and run through. And I just showed you this one, but the number is slightly different because this is the thing that I've set up for the article itself. So so don't don't get confused by that. But you mm -hmm. see, it has the same structure, and that's that's basically all you need to know here. And I'm going to look into this function first. And when you query this, all you need to do is to have a, a JSON document here. 
with text inputs as the key. That's really just what SageMaker expects. You see that in mm -hmm. the documentation when you look into the, the SageMaker documentation. And then in that case, because we use the plot, um, the summary of what the, the movies are about um, is, the, uh, is the value of that. And you pass that in uh, this JSON here with a content type and access the, the endpoint by its name using the SageMaker runtime client. The thing that we're using here to access SageMaker is because it's Python, there is a package that's called Boto3. And okay. that's really just the, 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 the AWS library to access all the AWS services out there. And you can see I create a client and really just pass in what the service is that I'm trying to use here. In that case, it's SageMaker. You can set up a client for basically any AWS service. And this is the library, library that we use here. And that's this, this part is showing how simple it actually is to access the SageMaker model. And what you get is what you get back is a JSON where there is a field called embedding, and that is going to contain the vectors that you just saw. The part up here, um, and you'll see, as I said before, you see all that code in the repository. Um, I'll, I'll, I've provided that all that the whole thing to you. Is really just to make sure if the if there were um, no query param parameters given, we get back a 400 to tell mm -hmm. the user, mm -hmm. okay, there weren't any query parameters. There's a 500 in case of any kind of exceptions, like that's what you usually see as an internal service server error, um, which is returning exactly the string that happened here, which makes it easier for our server application developers to actually figure out what happened on this side, and then the positive path over here. But that's really just the handling of the request. The interesting part down here is how do I actually get the embeddings? From, oh, yeah, just, um, just a embedding. question. Just, just to see if I understood this. So you call get embeddings, passing in yes. a JSON document that contains text inputs, and there you put your prompt, like I want a happy movie or whatever you want to, you know, to, mm -hmm. to convert into a vector or the synopsis of the movie in, the, in this case. And then you call SageMaker, return this vector, mm -hmm. And yep. you are returning up there. If I pass a query parameter, you are returning a 200 and another JSON with the embedding in there, like the vector there. Okay. Did I get yeah. it right? Or Yeah, just one small detail. I don't pass a JSON in here. This is really just a string. So th th okay. this one is the string of the query that I'm sending here. So this is a simple string input. And then what you, what you send back is a, a, a JSON, which is the usual format that we use to send uh, data between APIs and, and uh, consumers. And this one has just one field, which is called embedding. And this one contains the embedding uh, um, variable, and, which is a, an array with 384 entries. I hope that made it. Yeah, that's perfect. Clear. But how, how did you call this thing? Like. Uh... You have this Lambda, which they say is serverless, but in reality is server configless because, you know, there's a server running <laughs> this. <laughs> but how, yeah. how do you uh, run this thing? Like, how do you call yeah, it? Yeah, exactly. That's that's the next step. So we need another service for this because this is um, this is just a function, the function that actually gets executed. Mm -hmm. And the thing that is executing the function is called API Gateway. I'm going to come over here. API gateway. An API gateway is a super easy and convenient way to create all kinds of uh, all kinds of um, APIs. I was just wondering why I'm actually seeing the sign in button got locked out here, but maybe my session is over. No, it's still fine. I'll get it. And when you come over here into API gateway, maybe that's the better way to show it. HTTP API, a WebSocket API, a REST API, um, some kind of private um, hidden REST API behind a virtual private um, network. And you can use those to easily build a new API that offers certain services. This one, for example, works with Lambda. This one actually also works with Lambda, by the way. And that's, I'd say, the typical way to expose your Lambda function to the outside world, unless you want to just use the Lambda function directly, which you can use doing uh, using the um, AWS SDK or the CLI to access it directly, to have a more generic way, I use a REST API here, and that's what we've built. So when I go back to the APIs, you can see, let me make this a bit smaller so it's easier to see, something that's called a SageMaker API. That's just the name that I chose to make it easier for me to remember. 
And then you got all your resources in here, the way you usually know that from a REST service. It even offers a way to have certain stages. This stage is called test. I could also have dev and prod and mm -hmm. all the other ones that I need. Um, but to keep it simple, it's just a, a test stage here. And the way it actually works, let me come over here, because this is actually a really nice way to show it. Um, and API Gateway visualizes that quite nicely. The client here, any kind of consumer, or if you go back to, just in case you got this open and are wondering what's the client here, the client in that case is the server app that is actually the client for this backend, right? So it's always a bit tricky to get the naming right, but um, just to make sure you don't get confused. So whatever consumer is out there is sending a method request um, to this REST API endpoint, and then API Gateway can send an integration request to one of those services that it integrates with, Lambda being one of them. And the Lambda integration back here is showing that we're executing a Lambda function here, which is the one I just showed you. And then we get a response, which are the embeddings that we talked about. And this integration response coming from Lambda is then passed on, and that's what's called a method response, back to the client so that they get the embeddings and can actually use them. And this part is actually quite quite nice and easy because we really just have a put in a couple of names for the stage and the resource and really the only configuration and you'll see that in the tutorial is I have a query a URL query string par parameter and it's called query and this one is bringing in the string that I actually want to send through and that's more or less all you you've got here in this case and then when you come over here to so in, in relation to your question then, Diego, has that explained it well in terms of we're going to make the query, in this instance, we're, we're sending in a synopsis of a movie. We're looking for movies, and we have an idea of the type of movie that we want to watch. So we need to send that query in, and we need to create the embedding for that query, and we need to get it back out the other end. And Lambda's managing all of that piece on the other side. Lambda plus SageMaker, obviously, to make embeddings. That makes sense? Yeah, no, I I'm, I was thinking that you can always expose SageMaker directly, but then everybody will have your Amazon keys, which maybe is not good. So, you know, a way to decouple the API from the actual implementation is to use uh, these two services. This yeah. way you can run in a Lambda or you can run in your own EC2 instance or whatever you want. Also, this will scale. You know, if many people are hitting the same APIs, this will scale and will tell also the Lambda that it has to grow up or something like that. But I'm curious about that query parameter that you are using there. You're using a query parameter, but I think I remember in your Python code, there was also something called query. Are they connected somehow? Yep. There are a couple of different things actually here. Let me come over here. So I'm going to go into the code in a second, or just those parts that we're interested in. But before we even look at the code, what I can do here, let me just make sure it's the right one, this one. So mm -hmm. you just saw the URL over here. Um, so it's saying uh, it's got some ID, and then Northeast, uh, AP Northeast 2, which is the region that I chose on amazonaws.com. Test is my stage. And the resource name is SageMaker resource. So that explains what all, all that means. And on that SageMaker resource, I can then send the get request. And the query parameter is what we see here again. This is the query parameter that I sent in. And let me just go back to the Lambda and eventually see here again. And that we've also oh. seen, sorry, I clicked into the wrong direction. That we've also seen here as the query that is passed through. So all those queries are the same thing. And if I come over here and send this, I'm just going to send foo because I can send any kind of text that I want. API Gateway is going to extract this one, which is called query, and then send it on to Lambda. And Lambda is then going to look for a parameter that's called query. And that's why they all have to add up. Otherwise, the Lambda is eventually not going to execute. And if I execute this one here, and it hopefully works, what you can see is I am, so here is where it starts. I am getting back a JSON document with exactly one field in it called embedding. And this one has a vector of, in that case, you just have to trust me, 800, uh, 384 <laughs> values. They all look a bit similar, but the 
they are different and that's the way that in the end we get the data into um, our database to actually be able to execute the vector search but that's a good but there's no problem uh, there you can clearly read like foo no right everybody can read their foo <laughs> this time it's just it's just totally. a machine representation foo foo broken foo. up into into 384 parts yeah three letters yeah. now have become 384 <laughs> vectors right so someone might uh, yeah i was about to say someone might ask okay i got like three a string with three letters and now it's all this stuff but it's mm. uh, that's that's a lot of data to represent just foo but um th the important bit is that that that's something that you can e easily get wrong they all all those entries or all the data that you got in your database has to have the same representation otherwise the whole mm. thing is not going to work so whatever you put in is going to end up being an array with 384 entries no matter how short no matter how long it is it's always going to be the same because this is the only way the the vector search can happen in the end um to actually yeah, to actually get your data so this is step number one. That's good. We can actually access the endpoint and we can actually get the data or the, the embedding out of this one. So far, so clear. Diego. Yeah, I, I think so. But you know, you are getting this in the console. How do you put it in MongoDB and and how do you search it? Yeah, that's the that's the that's the, the interesting part, I'd like to say. So the thing that I've done here, and that's that's going to be part three that we'll release tomorrow, is I've set up a brand new project and I've set up a brand new cluster. Uh, once again, I'm also not going to click through that because it's like super easy to do and quick, but it's going to take five minutes to set up. So I'm just going to show you what it's going to look like in the end. And for those of you who haven't done that recently, you actually just noticed that that has been a new feature. Uh, you can actually click on while you create a cluster, you can even click on import the sample database right away. So what you will end up with, um, if you go that route, is something that's called movies or embedded movies as part of the sample Mflix, um database that gets automatically imported. And that's quite quite cool because you get sample data that you can play around with. And that's all I've used here. So that's not something that I've come up with myself. That's exactly mm -hmm. the same sample da data that you can use if you want to, to follow the tutorial. Atlas offers you the functionality to get the data in there. The only thing that I've added, which is the thing that is uh, the data that we get from SageMaker, and that's also part of the code that you get, is the field called embedding. And there's two things to that. So the first thing I'd like to show you over here, the two functions or the two, um, actually not here, but, uh, sorry, here, this one. Uh, the two things that you want to do, and I've, I've shown that in the um, in the diagram earlier, when you want to actually search for or semantically search your data, there's two things that you have to do. And the first step is to actually create your embeddings and then to use vector search. And for, for the first part that I'm just talking about now, um, I've, I've provided the code for you. It's a function called add missing embeddings. And, um, this part is really just the, the Atlas part that is checking, okay, which ones don't have an embedding at the moment, but something familiar that you'll see down here, and this one is just assuming we only get a couple of new movies. You wouldn't want to do that initially for a database with thousands of entries, just as a side note. But this one is um, getting embeddings, and those embeddings are behind this create embeddings function. And here you'll see something very familiar, something called an embedding service, which is really just a URL that I've defined in my environment variables. And I can even come over here. You can see this is exactly the URL that we just used for uh, the, the call that we did, the curl call that we did on the terminal. And then I pass in my query. And this one is the encoded plot um, to yeah to actually be able, and this, this URL encoding here, that's just a little uh, library mm -hmm. that makes sure that that works. Uh, pass in the plot, and then I get back the, um, and then I call this, and then I get back the embedding this is the same field name that you saw earlier in this JSON, which is giving me the vectorized version of the plot that I put in here. And by doing so, I can go through my plots and then actually update my data. And that's the, the statement over here. I have an update operation. And then I actually, um, if I have, I have like two or three at the same time, I can do this. And um, then I write the whole thing to the database. And this is how those arrays 
get into the database. That's step number one. You have to prepare your embeddings. You have to put the embeddings into your database, into your collection. And what you want to do, and Shane mentioned it earlier, data that um, gets access together has to be saved together, right? So you don't create an additional collection or put it into a different document in the same collection. You can just put it into the same, uh, in, in, sorry, in a different document in the same collection. You can just put it into the same document where the plot lives. So if I scroll around a bit here, there's something called full plot. There's something called plot. Plot is the one that we use in this case. And the same document contains the plot and the embeddings down here. There are also other plot embeddings that are auto-generated for you using a completely different model. So just in case you get, uh, you see this and wonder what, what, what is one and what is the other. Mm -hmm. This is coming with the sample data. This field is created by us using the tutorial where I show you how to do that yourself so that you can actually learn how to get to the step where the embeddings are in inside your database. Do you know what embeddings the sample data used? I think it's OpenAI, no? That's OpenAI, yeah. 1536 open AI. is, mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure is OpenAI. Okay, good. Um, but it's a good point. It's, you would have to know which model it is. Um, that's certainly stated in the documentation. You can read that up. Um, yeah. in the Atlas documentation in that case. But um, yeah, the, the the one that we're using here is the, the all MIDI model. So we know that okay. one, that's fine. We've just two questions come in. I'll, I'll probably take this one. I think, look, oh, yeah, sure. um, you know, the, the large language models, it's in the name, Lar they're, they're enormous. Some of the biggest language models out there have a hundred billion parameters and they take maybe, you know, 200 gigabytes. So you would you know i can understand where the question's coming from but you're not going to want them in the same place you're not going to want to look after them you want to be able to offload all of that work somewhere else what you need and all that you need actually are the embeddings like dominic has presented there you need to send your data through to get the embeddings but once you've done that you're you're mostly done now as you update those data you've got to do you got to redo your embeddings for the updated data and you know things like triggers etc can manage that to keep that in sync for you so uh, i i understand where it's coming from i don't think in reality most people would need to leverage this or need to have it have it together the second question i i'll throw it out to dominic to answer this one as well yeah. too but a is not equal to b in this instance right so it just wouldn't work you have to keep them similar the same, exactly. Can, the can same. I can I get this yeah. one and, and answer it? Yeah. <clears throat> and let's see if I learn something uh, just reading Dominic's articles. I think no. Correct me if I'm wrong, because you know this would be like a, using a model to uh, get meaning from the name of a city, and you convert every name of a city into a vector of two numbers, latitude and longitude. I think we've been using those embeddings throughout all our lives. And then I use a different model, which transformed the name of a city into latitude, longitude, and altitude. Uh, then you have three numbers. You cannot compare an array of three numbers to an array of two numbers because they have different, um, different um, di dimensions. So basically, the algebra is going to freak out. So if you uh, um, create your embeddings using one model, you have to send your prompts and send your queries to that same model, get a vector that matches the, the dimensions, and then use that inside Atlas Search just to find what you're looking for. Is that a good explanation, maybe, Dominic? That's correct, but it's even going further. Even if you had two models, which are different from each other, but both of them produce the same amount of uh, the, the same dimension. Mm -hmm. of an embeddings vector. So let's say I got my mini LM, all mini LM, see, I get it even wrong myself, <laughs> um, model which produces an embedding with 384 entries. And I use a different model, which just happens to also produce embeddings with 384 entries or a dimension of 384. It still wouldn't work because those vectors would look different. So the, the, the way the vector search in the end works is that you also send uh, it, as the question suggested and you explained that you also send the query through the same model and then i compare how similar or rather how far away from each other those vectors are there are different methods to do that 
for text comparison, usually cosine is the mathematical function that's used to um, yeah, compare those vectors to each other. And whichever vector is, <clears throat> is closest to the query vector is, is most likely going to be the answer. And this is the, the chosen one that you get back. And we'll see that in a second when I query for, for, such an, uh, for such an embedding, or rather execute a vector search to actually get the, um, the, the movie that I'm looking for. And you can only do this if, if they are all um, created in the same way. Mm -hmm. So even if I had those two different models, same dimensions, it would still not work because they look differently and you would just get the wrong results. So you always need to say you need the same model. And that's the SageMaker model that we deployed here. Perfect. And you can I see hope that, that answers your question there, yeah, Abby. We have yeah. a comment in from our colleague. <laughs> uh, oh, Eric, hi. So Eric thinks your query equals foo is a great example, and he's going to figure how he's going to use that himself too. But the, his point there is, you know, it's a great use case for when relevancy matters, but embeddings aren't the way to get there. As we said, we transformed a three-letter word into 700 <laughs> or 384 vectors, not really yeah. ideal. And you would certainly not try to do that in, in, in reality. So thank you for that, Eric. Yeah. And um, so what I, what I finally, because I just noticed we're like uh, just 10 minutes ahead of the end of today's show already, um, and th the magic hasn't even happened yet. So what the what the code provides you with is uh, are two things is the update movie is what we talked about is actually how to um, update the embeddings for a new movie that gets in. But the interesting part obviously is how can I actually search? And this is done using vector search in Atlas. As we've seen, and I'll look into Atlas in a second because there's one thing that's important for that. As we've seen, we need to create an embedding for whatever query we want to send to the endpoint and then we need to actually execute the vector search and the code is also provided i'm not going to go into the details here but we use the um we use the aggregation pipeline here as you can see down here um in line 75 and this code the aggregation pipeline is is a very powerful way to work with your data to say it very generically because there's loads of things that you can do search just being one of them vector search specifically which is the one we're going to use today and one of the things you see here is path we've seen that the embeddings path is just up here defined as embedding that's the field name the name of the field in the database um uh that i that i just gave that name that's how it uh, got there but the other important part is that there is a vector search index. And when I come over here, you see something that's called a vector search index here. So you might you might know indexes um, from other use cases. You create indexes to make your data easier to search for, and you could also not do that. It would not be perf very good performance, but you could, if you wanted to not do that for, for vector search, you have to create this index. Otherwise, it's not going to work. The vector search index is a specific index for vector search. That's why you see index type vector search here. And the index field that we're using is called embedding. That's how this entry here um, is connected with all of that. And the vector search index provides the necessary information for vector search, vector search to actually execute the search um, over your data. So those are the two parts that you need. You need the embeddings in your data, and you need the vector search index. And then you can actually issue an aggregation pipeline uh, or execute the, ex the aggregation pipeline and get um, the results for your vector search here. And the thing that you'll see down here is called a projection. That's basically just making sure that I see the specific values that I'm interested in. And because this is a movie search, the only one that I'm interested in is the title. So far for that. And now let's see what actually happens if we execute that. So we we'll come over here. Wait, crash? What, what am I? No, it's I'm just like. I don't know what I just did uh, because I know what the shortcut is, but I clicked somewhere else. So there's two <laughs> things that I proper done. live demo. Yeah, that's it's really true. Um, I, I'm just running the program here for you. For those of you familiar with Python, you might know Flask, which is the library that I used here for development purposes to just run a server, and that's the server application we saw earlier in uh, in the uh, architecture diagram. 
and that's just running locally here for demonstration purposes. And if I come back here to, yeah, that's the right one. Let me make that a little bit bigger. Jesus, that's just one pixel that I can touch there for making it bigger. So what you see here, um, you get the IP address is obviously dot lo uh, is dot local. I was about to say for our conference <laughs> in the brain. Amazing, um, uh, local host so one twenty seven zero one, and in that case, Flask per default is running on port five thousand. You saw the endpoint earlier is called slash movies slash search. Mm -hmm. I have to. Um, Put the content type to application JSON, otherwise it's not going to work. And then once again here, query, and the, the query that I want to send to actually search my data, I chose in that case a movie about Earth, Mars, and an invasion, which hopefully is giving me a really great movie that I've watched a very long time ago um, as our first result, which is the War of the Worlds. I also get three, uh, four more <laughs> results. Uh, counting is hard, right? And uh, we're always off by one. So three more results because zero, you know? <laughs> I don't know if that was funny, but um, this is just a configuration that I'm always interested in the first five results, which you see here, if you look at the limit, I could also change that and say, I only want the number one result because I only want to present the user, the one example that I got or the one result that I got. Um, this is all up to, to you, the way you want to configure this. But the cool thing is that, and. Uh, what I still think is magic, even though I understand how it technically works, um, all I'm inputting here is a description of the movie the way I chose it. And the result that I get is exactly the movie that I'm looking for, which indeed is about Earth, Mars, and invasion. So that's how vector search works. And that's what we can do with it. And the way we can offer, uh, or the way that we can offer to search your data not just by, I think someone mentioned earlier, full text search, not just by uh, full text search or fuzzy search or all the other ways to search data, but to actually, yeah, get the meaning, the semantics of what so, I'm looking into. So can you search for a happy ending movie, something like that, and it will sure. understand that? So when, when you change the query here, you are hitting yeah. your Flask Python server. This Flask exactly. Python server is calling the API in AWS. That API gateway is calling the Lambda. The Lambda is going to SageMaker. You are building a vector. You are getting back the vector to your Python code. And then you are searching from there inside MongoDB. And then you are getting the, the movies back, right? Perfect Did I get it right? Yeah, yeah right. That's, the trip. that's what it looks like. There's a lot, it sounds like a lot because we use a lot of services. And first of all, we use two different um, uh, pro like products or uh, like AWS and MongoDB or AWS's services and Atlas to say it more specifically. And in here we use multiple different services. So it might look a bit in intimidating if you first look at it, but if you go through the tutorial and I've showcased that a little bit today, hopefully, it's all quite easy to set up, but there's only a couple of things to do here and there with Atlas Vector Search. You only have to define a, an index, and that's about it. But that's what you eventually end up with. And you can see the this is just the, the endpoint running here locally that is receiving those requests. But we can search for, also, for whatever we want to. And, um, and yeah, also, let's see what we uh, get here. Uh, Dominic, I, I think I, I will drop something useful for once. <laughs> And I think that as you can run MongoDB Atlas inside AWS and you can host your Flask application inside an EC2 instance, everything will be, you know, inside AWS. Right now it looks like you are doing like a, a ton of trips, but everything will run inside the, the AWS cloud in the regions that you want. So you can scale it, uh, you can move it from region to region, you know, so how, exactly. I, mm. I think this way is easier because right now, you are running in local host and then you're going to MongoDB Atlas, but you can run MongoDB Atlas inside a, inside AWS. So it makes sense when everything is inside the same umbrella. Okay. So what we which one? Blood River is is has a <laughs> I love the results. Ending. Again, this is this is a live okay. demo. Uh, wrist cutters, a love story. We're gonna have to go into IMDB and check that one out to see if it does that. it doesn't sound as if it has a happy ending, Diego. Most definitely. The, the, I don't know the invention of lying. Maybe if you lie, you know, happy lies. Maybe I think maybe. that does. Yeah, it, I, I've yeah, seen that. That's a Ricky Gervais white lies movie. I think, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Is it? I, oh yeah. There you I go. think the key thing here is that you know this query plus the previous one 
you know, a movie with a happy ending, it would never be written in the synopsis from the movie's database that we have. You'd probably never see those words together. But the yeah. semantics nature of this and the semantic nature of vector search, as you said, Dominic, it gets the meaning of all of the text that's in the synopsis. And that's what the vectors are plotting across all of those 384 dimensions. So, you know, it, if, if there's a dimension about how happy is this movie, then these are the movies that are scoring higher in that value, or happy is the ending of this movie, et cetera. So that puts it in context. I mean, usually vector search and is used essentially for, you can use it for a semantic search, reference engines, um, you know, the Gen AI stuff is in for chatbots, et cetera. It's all about extracting the meaning from data. Whereas heretofore, data was, you know, for want of a better word, very black and white, very binary. You know, I'm searching, as somebody asked about full text search, if I'm searching for the word happy, then that needs to be in the synopsis or the, you know, in this instance, and then it'll return the movie title that had the word happy in the synopsis. Whereas in this instance, we're searching for happy as a meaning. And these are, well, potentially the five movies that have <laughs> happy as the meaning. I'm really doubtful about wrist cutters in the middle, but the rest of them look pretty promising. Yeah, that's true. And uh, the, I mean, oh, the can other we, thing can is... we do one more query, Dominic, before yes, we wrap things up a little bit? Diego, come on, dig into the back yeah, no, of your I, brain I, there. Another no, odd no, I, query I, for Dominic. I, I, no, 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 no. I have one, uh, just uh, movies from the land of the free and home of the brave. You will be amazing about that. <laughs> movies from I, I've land seen of, of the, the free, free and home of the brave. The, this, this is. It's amazing Excellent. that this even works. It's like, well, in this case, Shanghai Express, maybe not, but you get uh, <laughs> all American movies. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it's amazing how it understands even the, from, you know, putting that, them. that I, I should well, like search for American movies. It's like, okay. Well. Right. And the important thing here to understand those, some of those hallucinations is uh, that's where fine tuning comes into place. That's yes. where cho choosing the right model comes into place. So your, your search is only as good as your data is, right? If you produce data that doesn't make sense or it's not good enough, it's not going to work. So the, the date, the model that I chose here is probably not the best of the best one I could have chosen for that specific use case. There might be a different model that might be better. Um, the, the vast majority of models, it helps us though to to find one that might just be better suited and sometimes you might have to try it out or uh, different models to actually figure that out or as i said you might have to fine-tune the model it all depends yeah. on your use case but you can eventually get there uh, and get it to a stage where you can can use it for your application and it's, it always spits the correct results back and that's uh, just fascinating and amazing at the same time uh, that's shanghai express is a 1932 american movie by the way so you know is it? I see. It's, there you go. It, Maybe it's actually it's not it, that wrong. Is is nailing it? All our American movies. So yeah, w well done, Sage Maker. Well done. <laughs> Excellent. So we've got to the top of the hour. We've gone through an awful lot. Dominic, is there anything that we didn't get to go through? Because myself and Diego were interrupting you too much. Is there any pieces <laughs> you missed? You know, good thing that I decided to actually not click through and really just show the results. Otherwise, we would have never gotten through. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think we've covered everything that we wanted to cover. So we looked at all the elements that we see here in in that in that diagram. Um, the it's actually just randomly uh, mentioning part three here. It's a funny funny coincidence how that sentence is actually a good fit for what I was about to say. The part three will be released tomorrow, so we can have the the whole series and look at how that all that works i think we covered everything and showed everything that was important if you want to do that for yourself and in your own aws and mongodb account the tutorial will walk you through there is not really any kind of uh, prerequisite in it I've, I've made screenshots and explanations for everything so mm -hmm. you should be able to really walk through click by click to exactly end up at the same result check out the repository look at the code um, it's written in Python, but it's very simple. So even if you primarily speak a different language, um, I, I hope it's um, it's possible to understand it. But the important parts are within MongoDB Atlas and IWS on the other side anyways. The code is really just to give you an additional tool to run something locally. 
uh, to get your development started. But a lot of servers are written in Python anyway, so I just assume that's maybe one good approach. And if you have questions, that's maybe also a good hint about the article. Um, first and foremost, we got our forums where you can post any kind of questions that you want. And you are also always free to like send them directly on, on Twitter or here on LinkedIn. Um, you see our, our names pop up here. So if you have any questions, please feel free to always ask and uh, make sure that the experience is as good as it can be for you. Excellent. And so there's the, I just had the link up for our developer center, developer.mongodb.com. And this is the link here now for our forum. So as Dominic said, part three is out tomorrow. So stay tuned for that. It's great to be able to step through all of these as well too. And any questions that you might have and anything that you see there in that article, you can jump across to the, the our forums as well. And our DevRel team, our engineers, the product people hang out there as well too only too happy to help. Um, I suppose we've covered a huge amount in this, Dominic, fair play for managing and steering this. You know, as people joined the streams earlier, they were bombarded with embeddings and LLMs and SageMaker and vector search and triggers and functions and API gateways. So I do hope that you've managed to absorb this. I think what Dominic has shared there is really interesting intro and an example of the power of vector search. So if you want to learn a little bit more about that too, um, you can jump essentially to the short link that we have. So mdb.link is always used on MongoDB TV for anything uh, that we want to get you quickly to. So just go to mdb.link forward slash mdb vector search. Simple as that. We'll get you to our vector search page and you can play around with that. If you're not already using Atlas, you can jump on and you can register for free for Atlas. Um, you get on on our M0 tier, which is free, free forever. And it's really, really super powerful for building out, you know, demos like this and proof of concepts and even your minimal viable product will get you a long way on our free tier all the time. And we have a huge amount of developers using that. And if you are interested and, you know, this has peaked uh, your interest in vector search, do go and check out those links. Um, and stay tuned more particularly to what we're always doing on MongoDB TV. There isn't just the Cloud Connect show. We have lots of our colleagues running their own shows as well regularly. So if you go to mongodb.tv, you'll see the upcoming episodes. And indeed, as I said at the beginning, the intro, we do this every Thursday, but there's loads of episodes on the other days of the week too. And anything we've ever broadcast is always viewable back on YouTube or on the events page uh, of MongoDB on LinkedIn as well, too. Any last words or thoughts? I suppose my biggest take on a lot of the Gen AI stuff and vector search and everything is for developers that all of this is super new. You know, machine learning has been around for a long time. Artificial intelligence has been around for a long time. But the speed and the power that we have in AI now is incredible. And I think from a developer's perspective, it's not too late to jump in and learn. There, you know, there isn't anybody out there with years and years of experience in generative AI. It just doesn't exist. And anybody who has that on their CV is immediately going into the bin, as far as I'm concerned. So there are plenty of tools and plenty of ways to learn more about the power of generative AI. And also from our perspective at MongoDB, what vector search means to that. It's it's allowing you to, as we said earlier, to have your data and your vectors stored together so it's incredibly performant and incredibly powerful. Any last words for those that joined us on our live stream on YouTube and LinkedIn today, Diego? Well, uh, not in all MongoDB TV shows I'll appear, so they are, you know, uh, worth a watch. And <laughs> uh, yeah, and, I think that this is super interesting that, you know, all AI is super confusing to me because, you know, there's uh, from image recognition to, you know, to natural language parsing, LLMs, uh, embedding models. There's like a whole lot of stuff to explore, but there's also like a, an increasingly growing number of tools and also the integrations are getting better and better by the day. So. Even SageMaker changed it from the first version of this article. Uh, poor Dominic had to rewrite it because, you know, everything is evolving. So, <laughs> yeah. yes, you know, brace yourselves. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's, it's magical in the sense that it works. And it's really amazing. And, yeah, it's not too late to learn. Never is too late to learn. That's absolutely Excellent. true. Final words, and Dominic? I, 
I can only encourage people to just yeah get into it, try it out with this or any other tutorial. Um, there is so much content out there and there, there's so much to learn and it's so super interesting to see how all that works and so many tools to actually work with. I just actually realized what I'm wearing because I actually wear this one and you can see the integration of MongoDB and AWS, right? Um, just works for, I don't know if you can actually see that, but uh, it's really went sweater here and I just figured it's actually a good fit. That was actually really random. Um, so uh, the, using both of those tools um, or products rather, is just enabling you to do loads of amazing things. And I can, can really just encourage everyone to just play around and um, try it out. And in, in the beginning, it might look a bit intimidating, as I said, when you look at architecture pictures and stuff like that, and things don't work. Um, we've all been there, and that's perfectly normal. And if you've never worked with AI, ML, uh, and all the other buzzwords that are out there, you, you might just get confused in the beginning, but that'll, that'll go away at some point, And then you can build all kinds of really cool things um so yeah just uh push through and enjoy the the journey of ai excellent and look that that's a great note to sign off dominic thank you so much for running us through this and as you said two of the articles are up already and the third will join it tomorrow so developer.mongodb.com for that diego thank you for joining us as well too and adding the color and and the insights and um you know catching Dominic once or twice and saying, excuse me, what are you doing there? So this is super important. We want people to learn. And obviously, you know, we're very familiar with some of these demos and some of these, you know, what we build. And all too often we can forget essentially our audience. And I think you played a superb role in that today by, you know, calling a halt to the action, querying <laughs> as to what we were doing at the time and how everything worked. So, and thank you for your uh, obviously very keen eyesight to pick up on Dominic's code there on the screen and how he was going through that as well too. So do appreciate that. But more importantly for everybody who joined us on LinkedIn and YouTube, we do appreciate your attendance. Please inform your colleagues, inform your friends that this is a regular occurrence with MongoDB. Uh, we see that our live streams and, and what we're doing out in the community has great effect. All of these uh, will remain on our YouTube channel and on our LinkedIn events channel. So you can watch them back at your leisure watch it back read part one part two and tune in for part three tomorrow but from me shane McAllister, and dominic and diego on the developer relations team here at mongodb tv uh, at mongodb all together not tv um it's been great to have you thank you for joining us and we do look forward to having you on board in a future episode take care everybody good luck goodbye everyone.